Good morning. Welcome to peace. Welcome to your Lord's house today. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. And uh, what we're going to do this, this Lenten season is uh, start a series called God on Trial. So we're going to take a look at the Passion readings during, the, during these Sundays of Lent. And the Passion readings are readings about Jesus' suffering and death. And they usually go from the upper room where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples all the way to the crucifixion. And what it does is just uh, prepares us so well for the Easter celebration. We see a couple of things. We see, number one, Jesus' willingness to undergo anything and everything in order to save us. We also, it also is an opportunity for us to reflect on our part in the, the sufferings, that it's our sins, but ultimately... Uh, as we see the cross, we just focus on Jesus' love. So the series God on Trial is going to take a portion of the Passion reading that we go through and kind of take from that uh, an answer to a common accusation against God and his church. Uh, so today, we're gonna, the Passion reading is going to be Jesus in the upper room. And the accusation against God and his church that we're going to kind of address is, is this. Sometimes people say that, that Christians make too big of a deal of sin. Like That's all you guys talk about is, is sin. Too much of it. People aren't that bad. Give people a little more credit. So we're going to take a look at that and uh, see what, uh, what God's response to that is, how we, how we can respond to that, and, and ultimately see Jesus as the solution for, for that. So today, uh, because we're going to be doing the Passion readings during Lent, I decided that I'm going to print those out in a booklet. And I tried to get around to many of you, but if you came in after I was getting ready up here, um, maybe during the first hymn, I'll go grab those booklets and, and just make sure everybody has one. But this is a, a booklet of the Passion readings that we're going to read responsively during the whole Lenten season. So um, we'll, we'll use these today, and if you can remember, and I'll make the announcement again after church, we'll hand these in again each Sunday so that we don't have to keep printing out a, a lot of words. But, um, so I'll hand these out in just a, just a minute. So with all those announcements and directions for our service, uh, let's begin our worship today. And to begin, let's begin with our first hymn, Come Away from Rush and Hurry.
I invite you to stand. Today our call to worship is from Psalm 71. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge. Dearly loved children of God, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Let us pray. Lord God, support us all the years of our lives that we may follow your gracious will, both in good times and bad, that our lives may be an unending testimony to your love and faithfulness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with our passion reading. Passion is from the Latin word passio, which simply means to endure or to suffer, and so that's where we get the, the name for these readings. Tonight, or today, our passion reading takes us to the upper room where Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples. So you can see how this is going to go. Um, we're going to read these readings responsibly, just as, it, as it's written here. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called the Passover, was approaching. Jesus said to his disciples, Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. They plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. They said, but not during the feast among the people, or there may be a riot. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. Judas went to the chief priests and to the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. They counted out for him thirty silver coins, and he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus sent two of his disciples, Peter and John, saying, Go into the city. As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Say to its owner, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. In the evening, at the proper hour, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured the water in, into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He asked them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Once you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. After Jesus had said this, he was deeply troubled and testified. His disciples were very sad. They stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. And he began to question and they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. One after the other they began to say to him, Jesus replied, The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, then God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My little children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The word of the Lord. At this time, I invite children of the congregation to come forward for a children's message. Good morning. Thank you for coming up here. It's great to have you. We're going to talk about Jesus. Yeah. For our children's devotions during this special time, did you hear what I said before? It's called the season of Lent. Yeah, that's kind of a different word, isn't it? Lent is a, is a special season where it helps us get ready for Easter. And so we often talk about Jesus 
uh, suffering and going through some bad things, but he was w- doing that willingly so that he could save us. So during this Lent time, what I want to do is I want you to, I want to look around the church throughout these next few weeks and some of the things that we notice, like that are on these, these uh, special altar cloths and, and different pictures and symbols in our church, I just want to talk about that so that when you see them, you understand what they are. So the first one I want to talk about today is what are some new things that you notice in our church today that are different from the last few weeks? Do you notice anything? What, what do you notice? Who wants to tell me? The, the cross is up here, isn't it? That was different. That's new. And what else? Do you see, what color do you see up here? What color? You see purple all over, right? Purple. Well, purple is pretty. Some of us like purple, but it's more than... The the reason we have purple up here isn't just because it's pretty. It actually is telling us something. It's helping us to remember something. Why do you think we have purple up here? Well, I want you to think... It reminds us of a time that Jesus wore purple. I have a picture up here. So when Jesus was captured and he was put on trial... Uh, a lot of the soldiers, they didn't believe in Jesus. And in fact, they made fun of him. They looked at a man who was beaten, who who had ouchies, who had blood on him, and they looked at him and said, there's no way he's a king. Does that look like a king? No. So you know what they did? They made fun of him. And they said, okay, you want to be a king? They put a purple robe around him which is what kings would often wear, is a purple robe. And they said, oh, look at this great king. And they made fun of him as a king with that purple robe. Was that very nice of them? No. They didn't realize that Jesus really was being a king. See, what do kings do? Kings go and fight battles and they win for the people. And that's what Jesus was doing by bleeding and dying for us. He was fighting the battle against the devil. He was fighting the battle against our sin, and he won. We're forgiven. And so the purple reminds us, when you look at this, I want you to be reminded that Jesus was made fun of, that he was, uh, people mocked him as a king, and he suffered that way, right? And it also reminds us of the times that we do that. Now, we wouldn't ever mock Jesus and make fun of him, would we? But why was Jesus suffering? It was because of my mistakes and my sins and your sins, right? Jesus took those sins on himself. And so we're reminded of two things when we see the purple. There's purple on the cross. There's purple on the altar. There's purple on the furniture. And it reminds us, number one, that we, we sinned, right? But it also reminds us, number two, Jesus really is a king. And he beat sin for us. Okay? So can you remember that when you look at the purple? And maybe next week when you come in, maybe somebody will ask you, why is there so much purple on there? And now you can tell them, right? It reminds me of my sin that that Jesus took on himself, and it reminds me of Jesus' victory as king. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for letting us be in your your house today in in church. Thank you for the purple that reminds us of... um, your great love for us, that even though we sin, you are the king who defeated that sin. Help us always to look to the purple and remember that you are our savior. Amen. Thank you for coming up here. Have your children's bulletins. We'll continue by singing our next hymn. All right. So this is the older one here. And the the younger one here. Yep, you can take one of each if you'd like. I'm going to put that here. I'll help the little ones. There you go.
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. The word of God for our focus, we read in the Passion reading. I'm going to focus on uh, Mark's recording of it in Mark chapter 14, but, but these are the, the words. Um, After Jesus had said this, he was deeply troubled and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. His disciples were very sad. They stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he, he meant and began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. One after the other, they began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. This is God's word. So again, as we begin this series, God on Trial, the kind of the accusation that is brought against God and really God's people is this. The church just makes too big of a deal of sin. People aren't that bad. And just so you know, it's not a straw man argument. You hear it in songs. Um, country song. I believe most people are good. Um, You you see it on social media posts. People are taught to be bad or evil. Um, You've had these conversations with people, right? Why do you guys talk so much about sin? So we want to address that a little bit today. What What is the Bible's answer to that? And I think we see this in Jesus' words that we just read. So to start out, I want to start out with a picture. This is uh, May 6th, 1990. I'm wondering if you can, this is my confirmation day. I wonder if you can pick me out. I'll just give you a hint, there's a lot more hair then than now. My mullet ears a little bit. Um, I like this picture, <laughs> not because of uh, the looks. I mean, speaking of hair, just look at all the the cool hair back then. You can tell what era it was. But I like the picture because when I think of that accusation, I, I kind of am brought back to this, this day, this, this picture. Because I look at this group of people and good memories, good people. I can tell you all kinds of stories about these people. Um, I can tell you about the, the classes that we had and kind of how strict our pastor was, but yet how fun he was. I can tell about the pranks my cousin and I would play on the pastor. I can um, tell you about the ones who would goof off, the ones who had no problem at all memorizing scripture. A lot of good people up here. Obviously, in the years since, people's paths have been different, but good people. And so I look at that accusation, I go, yeah, it's kind of true. I mean, differences, but not so bad. But I also pick this picture because I can look at these faces and tell you different stories, too. More sad stories. I can tell you about the people that I didn't see after this day again in church. People who just slowly drifted away after their confirmation. I can tell you about people who made some big mistakes. Some people who are living lifestyles that are contrary to God's word. And yes, I can even look at that young face of mine and tell you of times, many times, where I did not keep my confirmation vow to remain faithful to the Lord. And so this picture to me summarizes this, this accusation because it, it, it shares a stark truth to me, a truth about people. It's a truth that goes beyond the smiles, goes beyond the white robes, it goes beyond what you do, what you promise. And the truth is, it's not all good in people, is it? It's not all good, and I, I'm a perfect example of that, and I think we all are. But the question about the accusation is, well, how bad is it? How bad is it? And, and is it something we should be talking about a lot? And if it is, how does this affect our relationship with Jesus? So that's what we're going to explore as we look at these words about Jesus. So let's shift our attention from a confirmation class, and let's shift it to 12 men around, 13 men, but 12 men around Jesus at a table, the disciples. Just think about what you know about these men kind of group is this? It's kind of a strange group when you think about it. It's kind of an eclectic gathering of people. You've got a tax collector. You've got religious zealots. You've got fishermen. You've got low class. You've got maybe high middle class. It's just kind of a a strange group of gathering of people, but yet it's a group of good people, isn't it? These are people who sacrificed 
a few years of their lives to follow Jesus and study his word. People who would witness his miracles. People who would confess their faith in Jesus. People who would take a short missionary journey already before this. People who vowed to die for Jesus if that's what it took. These are good people. And yet, it's interesting. In this good group of people, arguably maybe the best people on earth, the disciples of Jesus, right? Even in this group, on this night, Jesus peels it back. And he goes deeper beneath the appearances, beneath the promises, beneath the assumptions. And what does he say about this group of good people? I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. How do you imagine the disciples reacting? Shock? Maybe a little anger? Some protest? If they believed with their whole heart the accusation that people aren't, you talk too much about sin, people aren't that bad, then those should be the reactions, right? No way, Jesus. How could you say that about us? But it's, Mark gave us the reaction. We read the reaction. Mark immediately says they were saddened. They grieved. Why that reaction? It's because of what Jesus is revealing. Let's take a close look at the words Jesus says about that. First of all, he says, one of the twelve, one who's eating with me, this group of good people, these close friends of mine, it's in you. But he goes even further. It's, it is one of you, looking at each one of them individually, one who dips into the bowl with me. And that's where it got very personal. Because I imagine the scene when Jesus says that, each one of the disciples is probably holding a piece of matzah bread with uh, that they used to, to dip that sweet kereseth from the bowl that was passed around the table. Each one of them was holding that piece of bread, so it could be any one of them. And as they looked at that piece of bread in their hand, it was like looking into their own hearts. And it revealed the truth. All of a sudden, they had to think about the times that their hearts doubted. The times that their hearts were embarrassed of Jesus. The times that their hearts were slow to understand what he said, and so they decided to ignore the word. Each one of them at that moment knew what they were capable of. And it's no wonder why Judas is never mentioned here yet. He's never mentioned. Did you notice that? Not until the end. Because he's pointing out that every single one around the table asked the question. One by one, surely not I. In other words, every one of the disciples asked, is it me? Because they realized it could have been. They realized what was really in their hearts. Now, we have the hindsight of knowing who it was. We read it. It's Judas. And because of that, we can push back and, and use that accusation, okay, obviously Judas was evil. Right? But he's the exception to the rule. Most people are good, but there are exceptions. Uh, you see that very clearly. Have you ever heard of Dante's Inferno? Have you read that? It's a, basically a book about the, this is oversimplification, but about the different levels of hell. And each level is worse than the other one. And at the very bottom level, the worst level, at the very center of hell, is not the devil in, in Dante's book. Who is it? It's Judas. Right? And that's how we look at evil, that there are some really evil people, but most people are good. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. That's not what the disciples were saying, right? What did each disciple say? Each of them wondered, is he talking about me? And because there's the truth. The truth about humanity, the truth about disciples, the truth about me. That we are sinners. And everyone, not just Judas, was capable of the worst sin. And I get it. I, I just wanted to lay it out. That, that's where the accusation comes, right? Here we are again. I'm making too big of a deal about sin. Society and culture, our, our unchurched friends, our, our 
social media friends, they, they bristle at this. You're selling humanity short. So maybe it's because of this. Why do we talk about it so much, and why does it make people bristle? Maybe it's because there's, there are some misconceptions about sin. What is sin? How would you define sin? How do we normally talk about sin? We usually talk about it like this. It's sin is breaking a law. It's breaking a command. Right? And that's true. That's true. But I think that's almost surface level. Sin really is deeper than that. And when you understand that it is deeper than that, that's why it's so important to talk about it. So maybe to help us understand, to get a better understanding of what sin is, let me, let me just use an illustration. I want you to picture a single mother raising a son. Just think about that situation. That, that's a lot of work, isn't it? It's a lot of sacrifice, right? There's a lot of sacrifice of time, right? A sacri- sacrifice of money, sacrifice of own personal goals. That's true, but at the same time, the mother never resents it, right? Because the mother loves her son. That son is the world for that mother. And so imagine the son gets to college age and goes off to college, and after the first couple weeks, drops out of college somehow takes all the money that was given for college, all the money that the, the mom has ever put into his account, and he goes and he takes expensive trips and he buys a bunch of clothes and cars, and, and the mother finds out about this but has no idea where the son is. He's just gone for months. Finally, six, eight months later, there's a knock at the door, it's the son. And he says, Mom! And he gives her a big kiss on the cheek. How do you think mom feels at that moment? What what do you think she says? Maybe it wouldn't go exactly like this, but I can imagine her saying, I love you, but something is seriously wrong here. And I can imagine the son saying, Ah, mom, you're just so grouchy and cranky. And the mom's saying, Really? Grouchy? Cranky? No. The problem is you don't understand how a relationship works. You gave me a kiss, but you don't love me. You're using me. Something is broken here. You see, what's wrong? It's not so much that he maybe broke mom's commands to him. He broke mom's heart. And I think if we understand sin that way, we see how big it is. Right? Sin is certainly breaking laws, but not so much breaking laws, it's breaking God's heart. People have broken the heart of God who has done everything for people and wants nothing more than just a loving relationship with him. But we've broken his heart. And you can see that in the upper room. Right? These are his friends. The ones closest to him. All of them were capable of betraying him. And I think it hits home, too, for us, doesn't it? How can it not hit close to home when we hear Jesus' words? One of you. We weren't in the upper room, but Jesus has made us his dear friends through through water and the word or, or through the word when we came to faith. And yet, how often haven't we used Jesus and abused him and broken his heart. Jesus says, one who is eating with me. Today we're going to come up and share the, his meal of forgiveness that he has given us here at the altar. But how many times haven't our words and our actions betrayed Jesus? Matched the words and actions of the unbelieving world. And all of it reveals the real heart within us. That is not so good. The hearts that have their own doubts, the hearts that roll their eyes and ignore God's word, the heart that once in a while thinks, you know what, I think my life would be a lot happier if Jesus wasn't here right now. 
And every one of us have to go around the table with the disciples and say, is it me, Lord? When you realize that sin is breaking the heart of God, you realize why we talk about it. It's not good news, but it is truth. But maybe the accusation is right in a little way. We do talk about it a lot. I've spent a lot of time in this message already talking about it. But here's the thing. There's another truth here that Jesus is sharing. And it's the one that we ought to talk about even more. And I want to take a look at that. Surely not I, Lord. How many times was that question asked in the upper room? It was at least 12, right? And what has stuck out to me this week in in thinking about this is that never once, you know, each one may be disciple saying, surely not I, is it me, Lord? And, and Jesus never pointed at a person, not till the, the dipping came, right? Why didn't he? I wonder if it's because he wanted people to focus somewhere else. He didn't want people to focus on being a detective. All right, which one is it? Maybe even after a little reflection, he didn't even want them to sit and stare at their own hearts. Instead, he wanted them to focus on the one they should have been focused on the whole time. What happens if you put the emphasis on a different word in this sentence? One of you will betray me, Jesus says. And if you put the emphasis there, like I believe Jesus was, you suddenly see that the most important person that Jesus was pointing at in the upper room was himself. That the biggest news he was revealing was going to happen to him. Yes, it's sad that one of his closest friends was going to do this, but let it not be lost in all of this that, of the fact that it was going to happen. And Jesus knew it was going to happen, and he was willing to let it happen. He said, the Son of Man will go. This is going to happen because it is written. You see, this was the plan from eternity. This was what was written for centuries. Jesus isn't saying this so that we feel sorry for him. He's saying it to let us know this is going to happen. His acceptance of this was unwavering. He would go to the hands of sinful people. He would go to a rigged trial. He would go to the flogging pole. He would go up on two beams of wood and he would go down to the grave. And that's the most amazing truth that he's revealing here. That even though there is a sad reality about people's hearts, that there's sin there, the greater reality is that there is somewhere for those sinners to turn to him. With amazing love, he is shifting us away from what our hearts are capable of. And he's showing us what his heart is capable of. Being faithful to the unfaithful. Of paying the unpayable debt of sin. Befriending betrayers. Pardoning traitors. Renewing corrupt hearts. That's the beautiful truth about Jesus. And so, yes, we're going to talk about sin because it's serious, but ultimately what we really want to talk about is Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the one who heals those hearts. He's the one who healed the hearts in the upper room. He's the one who heals our hearts in this room right now. Any of you still have your, if you grew up Lutheran, do any of you still have Confirmation pictures? Maybe pull those out today, huh? Uh, You don't have to show them to me, although I'd love to look at them. But as you look at that, and maybe in a tradition you grew up in, it was a little different, but I think there's a similar situation, right? You can think about people you grew up with, maybe if you grew up in church, and think, damn, there's a lot of great memories, but you can also think of a lot of sad memories, right? That's what happens when you look at a group of people. But what I like about confirmation pictures is traditionally they're always taken in the same spot. And I know you couldn't see it in mine because I had to zoom in, but they're usually taken in front of the altar, right? Right under the cross. 
And I think that's perfect because where we want to look is at the people. Oh, this one's a good one, this one's a bad one. But instead of doing that, where's a better place to look? At the cross that is casting its shadow on these people. The cross is what makes people good because of God's forgiveness, because of his love, because of his acceptance in Jesus. And so, yes, the, the truth about our hearts is kind of sad, but the truth about Jesus makes us rejoice. Amen. May the peace of God that goes beyond our human understanding guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. It is good to declare our faith together today. To do that, we will use the words of the Nicene Creed. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time with hearts... Filled with thanks for, for Jesus and his, how he heals our hearts, we bring him our offerings. Uh, if you brought an offering, the plates are in the, the back. You can place those there. Also, online opportunities. This is a great way to give thanks to God and to continue the ministry, sharing Jesus with each other and with our community. Also, at this time, let's uh, take an opportunity to connect a little more deeply. If you desire, you can pull out a Connect card that's in your bulletin and fill that out if you have a prayer request Uh, For me and my personal prayers, if you'd like to meet and chat about anything, I'd love to do that. Uh, Just put that in the Connect card. And as we fill out the Connect card, we also have an opportunity to meditate on the Word of God we have heard today.
Thank you for the opportunity to connect a little further. If you did fill out a Connect card, you can place that in the, in the offering plate as well today. At this time, let's go to our God in prayer. What a privilege to carry everything to our Lord. Uh, one prayer request we have today is for uh, Natalie's uncle, my wife Natalie's uncle, Uncle Dave, who is having some heart procedures done this week. Is that? Yeah, I'm not sure all of it that's going on. So, yes. Uh, any other prayer requests that you'd like to include with that? Okay. I invite you to stand for prayer. Gracious Lord God, we give you all thanks and praise for you are our creating God and our redeeming God. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house today and once again reflect on who we are and who you are. Along with the disciples, we have to confess to you that we are uh, sinful. We don't like to think that we are capable of evil, but we know that that lurks in our hearts and in everyone's hearts, and, and we have proven it with our thoughts and words and actions. And yet, we look at you and we see that you are a gracious, forgiving God. We marvel at the fact that you planned out our salvation. You knew exactly everything that was going to happen to you, and you willingly took it on yourself so that you can be the one who heals our broken hearts and you can heal that relationship with God. As we live in that restored relationship with you, help us to give thanks with our lives, uh, showing our love for you and what we think and say and do and showing our love for you by sharing it with others as well. Lord, we ask that you would be with Dave Riediger this week as he uh, undergoes some procedures for his heart. Um, we ask that you would go with him into the surgeries to, to comfort him and help him to know of your great love and your abiding presence. We ask that you would be with the medical staff, that they work skillfully so that they can repair his, his body. And if it is your will, grant him a recovery so that he can be restored to health. In all these things, draw him close to you in your word and your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to receive Holy Communion. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. by his perfect life, he your holy will. by his innocent death, he us. by his rising from the grave, Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
I invite you to stand for the dismissal and the blessing. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us today with your saving gifts of word and sacrament. We pray that through these gifts you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Before I excuse the Sunday school, if you're children, I just would remember how we went, we talked about some things in the front today. We're going to do that throughout the season of Lent. What I want you to do is think about what are some other things you see up here that you would like to know about, okay? So you can tell me about those next week, all right? At this time, you can go back with your Sunday school teachers. And, as, and we will close with our, with our last hymn. Good morning. Great to be with you today. Uh, pray that God's word has been a, a blessing to you and will be throughout your week. A couple of quick things uh, in the back of your bulletin uh, are the Bible readings for the week. Um, normally there are a, an appointed set of readings for each week of the church year. And since we're doing the, the passion readings during the season of Lent, I thought I would m- make it available to you the readings that would normally be on, on the Sunday. So uh, those are there for you, for your personal devotions if you'd like, and if you want to just kind of stay along with um, other churches across the world as they meditate on those words. So those will be there each week. And then in regard to the, the Passion readings, um, the goal is just to, to print these out once. So you are welcome to take them home if, if you will use them and would like to, to read through it again. That's perfectly fine. But if you would 
or if you're not, uh, you can also leave those here and then we can hand them out each week. So uh, my thought would be to place them on the, by the offering plates. Is there room right there? Okay, yeah, place them by the offering plates on that little table uh, and we can hand them out again next week. There are snacks today. Stick around, enjoy some snacks and fellowship time with each other. Uh, share each other's highs and lows for the week and continue to build relationships among one another. Uh, also, we will have Bible study today. We're going to get into Mark chapter 2 and uh, study God's Word, apply it to our lives. So uh, please, please join us. We'll meet in the back uh, around the tables. So what other announcements need to be made today? Okay. Again, thanks for being here. God go with you and have a great week in your Lord. Thank you.